Unit 3, Chemical Oceanography, Lectures 12 through 16. Our first lecture is the water molecule, Lecture 12. So basically, when we look at water's molecular structure, we see that it is uh, composed of two hydrogen atoms that are polar, polar covalently bonded to one oxygen atom. Remember, in a polar covalent bond, a covalent bond is a bond in which the valence electrons are being shared between atoms. And in a polar covalent bond, that means those shared electrons are being un uh, shared unevenly between the oxygen atoms and the hydrogen atoms. And therefore, the uh, water molecule gets polarity, has this polarity to it. And if you look, here we could see the water molecule itself is a bent, the atomic structure is bent. And the hydrogens, which are represented right here in, in the lower portion of the molecule, have those partial positive charges. And up here in, uh, where the oxygen atom is in red, you have that slightly uh, partial negative charge. So you get a partial negative charge there. So the dipole movement of electrons is up towards the oxygen atom because the oxygen has a greater electronegativity value than that of the hydrogens. And because of that polarity, uh, that water molecule can do a special type of bonding called hydrogen bonding. And hydrogen bonding is a weak bond that forms between water molecules due to the uh, interaction between their slightly positive regions of the hydrogen atoms on the water molecule and the slightly negative charges that are found on the oxygen atom. So if you look at the arrangement, if you were to visualize what water molecules and their arrangement within a glass of water or within our entire ocean basins, uh, this is how the water molecules are arranged. We have those, the oxygen slightly negatively charged oxygen atom line up with the slightly positive charged hydrogen of another oxygen atom. And that charge differences, so yeah, that slightly negative and slightly positive is that weak hydrogen bond there. And water's polarity gives it a unique properties. So we know that water is a universal solvent. So it dissolves uh, just about uh, all substances on Earth that are, are polar as well. So like dissolves like. So when you talk about water serving as a solvent, anything that water is, is uh, used as the dissolving force, um, whether it be salt as a solute or sugar as a solute, you'd say you're creating an aqueous solution. So when water is the solvent, it's an aqueous solution. Uh, you also have the cohesion-adhesion forces, and we did some of this in biology, where you have that cohesive force is the attraction from water molecule to water molecule, so molecules that are alike. So that would be the hydrogen bonding there that causes them to be attracted to one another. Adhesion is when water is attracted to something different. So that water molecule could be, for example, a straw. So we, water is one of the uh, only substances on Earth that can exist here and in its three physical states, both as a solid, liquid, and a gas. Of course, solidified water is ice, and then you have liquid water our lakes, rivers, streams, and the ocean, and then you have gaseous state of water, which is water vapor, which can be found in the atmosphere. Uh, liquid at room temperature uh, is due to hydrogen bonds, unlike that in alcohol. Water also has a high specific heat, and that means it takes uh, a, a large amount of energy to change the temperature of water slightly. And that's important for aquatic organisms or organisms that live in any type of uh, marine or freshwater environment. Because if water did not have that high specific heat, any slight changes in air temperature would cause the change in, in the temperature of water. But that's not the case. This is why on a cool fall day, you could still go out to your swimming pool or still go to the beach when the temperatures are, are, are dipping down in the lower 70s and the water is still warm. So the air temperature is colder but that water temperature is still very warm. So if you look at the water budget on Earth, 71% of Earth's surface is water. And you can see that um, just by looking at our planet from outer space. We are a, it's called the blue planet. We call it the blue planet because of all the water that is distributed on our planet Earth. The volume of ocean water is about 1.35 billion cubic kilometers, 
which is 99% of the biosphere. So if we look, the distribution of Earth's water, 97% of, of the water on Earth is salt water or saline water. Only 3% is fresh water. And of that 3%, 68.7% of the fresh water is trapped in ice caps and glaciers and 30.1% of fresh water on planet Earth is trapped in uh, underground as groundwater. The other is 0.9% and 0.3%. 0.3 comprises surface water and that would be the water of lakes, streams, and rivers and uh, the 0.9% is other water sources. Of that 0.3% of surface water, 87% is trapped in lakes, 11% in swamps, and 2% in our, in our rivers here on Earth. So we are focusing on oceanography, so we're going to look at this 97%. 97% of the water on Earth is uh, salt water. And when we talk about the distribution of water or the movement of water through, the, through our atmosphere to land through organisms, we're looking at the, the water cycle, or what we would call the hydrologic cycle. And the hydrological cycle has these five main points. So we have evaporation, which is when water is going from a, a, uh, a liquid to a gas. We have transpiration, which is a special type of evaporation when plants are giving off water vapor to the atmosphere. And we recall if we did photosynthesis, you learned about transpiration when the stomates were open. When the stomates are open, the guard cells open up, you have that stoma, which is a, a pore in the upper, lower epidermis of the leaf that allows for gas exchange. And the gases that can go in and out are carbon dioxide and oxygen gas and water vapor. So evaporation from, of water from plants is called transpiration. You have condensation. So as water evaporates on the land and ocean surfaces, it rises into the atmosphere and eventually it will start to condense around particles in the atmosphere. So it starts to collect. So condensation is when it starts to go from a gaseous state back into that liquid state. And then of course you get the formation of clouds and as this moisture keeps building up and the cloud starts to grow, uh, eventually you would have that, that condensate fall back to the earth in a uh, one of many types of precipitation. So whether it be ice, uh, as in sleet and hail, snow, or rain. So that would be precipitation. And then as that land, uh, uh, that water hits the surface of the land, it could do one of two things. It can infiltrate into the ground and become groundwater. Or if the surfaces are impervious, it could run off. And it would run off and, and eventually end up into our street creeks and streams. And our creeks and streams, we know, all eventually end up into the ocean somewhere along the way. And we'll look at the hydrologic cycle in a small activity that we'll do in class. So 97% of uh, our water on Earth is marine or saline. And when we talk about saline, we're looking at salt. And salinity, lecture 13, is that focus. So salinity, it's a salt. And a salt is an ionic compound composed of a cation and an anion. So it's an ionic bond formation here, such as in table salt, where sodium is going to lose its one valence electron to chlorine, which has seven valence electrons. And therefore, you form both the cation and an anion here. And that force of attraction between the two is that positively charged cation being attracted to that oppositely charged negative anion, the chlorine atom here. And that's where we form sodium chloride. So ionic bond is when atoms transfer electrons to form an electrostatic attraction. And if we're look at, looking at a salt crystal, uh, because ionic solids form crystals, here you can see what that crystal lattice structure would look like, where the blue spheres here represent the anions of chlorine, and the smaller uh, reddish-looking spheres represent the uh, cations of sodium. So a solution is when you take a solute, such as salt, and you dissolve it into a substance, and that substance will be homogeneously dispersed among the molecules of that substance. So the salt would dissolve in the water homogeneously. The substance that is doing the, the dissolving is called the solvent, so it's the more abundant substance in solution. And the solute is the substance that's being dissolved in the solvent. And as we said before, 
water, when water is your, your dissolving force, it's an aqueous solution that is formed. And when you dissolve salts in water, you disassociate them. So disassociation is when that salt dissolves its ions are pulled apart by the water molecules. And let's see if we can look at that example in this video clip here. When an ionic substance such as sodium chloride is placed in water, water molecules interact with the ions on the surface. If the salt is soluble, the attractive interactions with water molecules overcome the ionic attractions within the lattice. The solvated ions move off the surface and become separated in solution. Notice that water molecules cluster about the anions with the hydrogens directed toward the negatively charged ion. On the other hand, water molecules interact with the positively charged cations through the lone pairs of electrons on the oxygens. So in the video, what part of the water molecule interacts with chloride and what part of the water molecule interacted with the sodium? Think about the polarity of water and the two ions you're dealing with in the uh, salt crystal. So salinity itself is the total concentration of dissolved salts expressed in parts per thousand, which we abbreviate PPT, or 0 slash 0, 0. And a salt crystal is how salt is added or removed from the ocean. So we're looking at not salt crystal, the salt cycle. So salt can be added to the ocean by runoff erosion of coastal rock and hydrothermal vents. It can be removed by certain biological and chemical factors. And the ocean itself is in equilibrium because these processes will balance each other out so that the average salinity does not change. So if we look at ocean salinity, it varies very little from 35 parts per thousand. So the average ocean salinity is 35 parts per thousand in a brackish environment where fresh water is going to mix with salt water, the range of salinity, depending on what's having the greater influence, will range between 0 0.6 parts per thousand to 30 parts per thousand. In a very brine condition environment, the water is saturated with salt, and the areas that experience this have high evaporation rates. So when you evaporate, this would occur around the tropical regions where evapor of the solar energy is directly coming in, and it's warmer, so you have greater uh, water evaporation occurring there, so the water will evaporate, but the salt will be left, be left behind. So in those environments, you, you'll end up with about 37 parts per thousand of water. So sea surface salinity, SSS, it's very high in the red regions where it's uh, around 37, and then in the blue regions, you have low sea surface salinity, which is a little less than 33. So why is salinity lower at the poles of Earth then? Well, we look at the poles of the Earth, this is where the glacia glaciers occur. And as glaciers melt, fresh water is entering into that marine environment, which therefore then would indeed also lower the salinity. So at the poles of planet Earth, you have lower salinity. And along the equator, where you have greater evaporation rates, you have a bit higher salinity. And this creates a halocline. Halo meaning salt. Cline is, is a vertical gradient. So the halocline is a strong vertical salinity gradient. And it shows us the changes in salinity with de depth. So at about 500 meters in depth, you see the salinity go from 35.5, a little bit below 34.5. And then around 1,000 meters, it increases again up to about a little more than 34.5 and that will extend all the way down to 4,500 meters in depth. And then there's the principles of constant proportion, which states that no matter how much salinity varies, the proportions of inorganic elements, so that's all the ionic salt crystals that would come together, those ions that form salts and compounds, uh, these do not change. So here are the constituents of seawalt, sea salt. You have chloride in red at 54%, sodium, is the second major one at 31% and sulfate in blue at 8% and then magnesium at 4%. So the major salt 